Good morning and welcome to the opening session of the 29th annual Hyman Minsky Conference on the State of the U.S. and World Economies. And the theme of this year's conference is the prospects and challenges for the U.S. and Europe in an emerging post-pandemic recovery. And this session will focus on prospects for reforming the financial system. My name is Bob Hoopscher. I am the founder and CEO of Advisor Perspectives, a widely read newsletter for financial advisors, and I will be your moderator for this session. The bios of our panelists are available through the conference website. I will briefly introduce them and then we'll get going. Our first speaker will be Paola Savona, who is an economist and chairman of CONSUB, the Commission Nazionale per la Societe e la Borsa, and he can tell me whether I pronounced that right, which is the government authority of Italy responsible for regulating the Italian securities market. Jan Kregel, our next speaker, is the director of research for the Levy Institute. He is recognized as an eminent post-Keynesian economist. Jan has served since 2006 as professor of finance and development at Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia. And our final speaker will be Charles Goodhart, an economist and emeritus professor of banking and finance at the London School of Economics. He was a member of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, the British equivalent of the Federal Reserve Bank. So with that, I will turn this over to Paolo to begin. Thank you. My ideas will be presented by my colleague Francesca Nedda. The only reason is that her English is better than mine, so you can follow my ideas and then we can discuss. Okay, so thank you so much. And I don't think I have a better English than Paolo, but okay, <laughs> we do it. Uh, I would like to share my presentation, so the presentation of Paolo, and you will, so I will read it, uh, and you will hear uh, me say hi, but it doesn't mean I, as Francesca, but as Paolo, just to understand exactly where we are. Uh, I will share now the, the presentation, and if... Robert, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, let me see if I can. Okay, so, so thank you so much to everyone. Um, so we start uh, first of all with a problem. So since uh, January 3rd, 2029, 20, money and financial market change with Bitcoin, uh, when Bitcoin was created, now we have hundreds of uh, cryptos in circulation. Subsequently, custody and exchange platforms between uh, cryptocurrency arose. And some beyond the custody and exchange uh, cryptocurrency also act uh, as a basis uh, uh, for um, crypto credit lines open to market operators to finance uh, their own initiatives. And the platform act uh, as efficient substitutes of banks and financial companies have the capacity to crowd out the former and originate as payment uh, instrument. Uh, cryptocurrency have now become uh, financial instruments. In other words, uh, crypto assets. So let's look at the impact of money and finance. In this situation, the frameworks of monetary policy, financial policy, and super, super advisory act activity carried out by the Fed, SEC, and other similarity foreign institutions are no longer clear-cut, nor is the transmission mechanism of economic policy decision. And we can say that certainly the genie is out of the, of the bottle. It cannot re-enter for two reasons. First, technology is now a shared resource, which is used by many who would continue to operate even in the face of existing rules or prohibition. 
And second, the decision has been taken by monetary, financial, and government authority to legitimize the use of this new instrument. So let's look at the current state of crypto affairs. The US and UK authorities have an approach open to crypto instrument and self-regulating self with existing rules. The ECB recently stated that anyone who starts a cryptocurrency business must be authorized by ECB. This affects the freedom of market operator, but not their activity because they, they operate in an infosphere. The result will be a crowding out of regulated markets and the displacement of activities to allow operators to act freely. It is possible to control the operation that take place in the infosphere. And one example is China has decided to do so by creating its own alternative protocol to one currently used. And by keeping a centralized center where the authorities collect all the information. So now we see the, my vision, although it's not my vision, <laughs> we share the vision, but it's Paolo's vision. Seems strange to speak about uh, my vision, but this Paolo. So, um, analysis made by public authority and scholars abound and on crypto monetary and financial innovation, but they have not produced a clarification on the type of institutional setup uh, to be given to this market and supervisory policies. In the absence of this clarification, crypto assets have expanded greatly. And here we have a number, an estimate of 2 million, 2 billion, 2,000 billion US dollar equivalent of uh, cryptocurrency alone. And the authorities have directly or indirectly legitimized the existence. And the interchangeability operated by the custody and exchange platforms, which have also served as crypto credit creators. Uh, with Jan Kreger, uh, I have already expressed my vision and for, and for what the lines of reform of the monetary and financial system should be. Referring to Minsky ideas, albeit reinterpreted in the light of the developments assumed by the cryptocurrency and crypto asset market. So now let's see the best solution. So first, money must be created only by public institutions, be it traditional or encrypted. If national states accept the presence of privately created money, the same technology base, protocol or blockchain DLT must be established for both. Second, the collection of savings in traditional and encrypted forms should be considered as financial instruments to be held in the same technological base, but with a permissioned and not permissionless decentralized accounting. And third, banks, a place outside the monetary creation circuit and together with financial intermediaries compete to collect savings and manage them with objective and safe methods as artificial, artificial intelligence algorithms. The logical base that is behind this uh, vision. To read the future of cryptocurrencies, I'm proposing to refer to the Gresham law of bimetallism and the fiduciary regime of money. Augustin Cartens, the DG of the BIS in Basel, recently presented a paper in which he argues that Gresham laws could work in favor of public money. But unfortunately, I disagree. The century old experience of gold, silver, bimetallism teaches us that it is intrinsically unstable because it is like to the different temporal rhythm of discovery of mines of one or the other metal, and that as an alternative cause uh, cycle of inflation or deflation. And if we uh, underestimate this implication, the implication, the most likely prospect is that monetary sovereignty will pass 
into the hands of the market and mainly into the, the hands of big techs, such as Facebook, uh, Libre. Uh, I therefore remain on the opinion expressed in 1996 uh, on the functioning of the free derivative market that sooner or later the state will have to intervene. My hope is that this is a wrong prediction because if it is not, the consequence could be dramatic. So what are the future implications? If I'm right, the problem would no longer be about technology of the financial accounting use, either traditional on paper or digitalized credit or innovative, a crypto, but about who has access to information and their uses. The law must therefore regulate the correct methods of acquisition and utilization of the public authority of financial information. This is why IT protocols and DLT methods must be considered public goods. That is, goods of public interest whose production must be guaranteed by the state. It must also ensure cyber security and the availability of no polluting energy sources and to reach social goals. As the growing European legislation on ESG, um, the environmental, social and governance uh, show us, uh, and also for any kind of crypto asset. So I reach now the conclusion. Market operator and existing public institution have to adapt themselves to the operation of markets in this opaque cyber universe of the infosphere. Incoming legis legislation cannot be independent of the technology, underlying a financial innovation which bypass existing legislation. And central banks, will have to issue their own cryptocurrency, absorbing the monetary functions of deposit banks and placing themselves in a DLT system permissioned to collect the necessary information. Private financial institutions will continue to manage payment systems through exchange platforms between traditional and crypto instruments and collect savings in competition with other intermediaries, managing them with AI methods. Thank you very much. So let me turn it over to Jan then. Okay, if oh. I can just set up my screen share. Okay, thank you very much. I'm <clears throat> honored to share this panel with such distinguished presenters. And I'm also happy to welcome, as I see in our attendees, a number of former students from the Levy Masters program, as well as a number of perspective students and current students. So welcome to them as, as well, as in addition to all people who have been past participants in the, uh, in the Minsky conference. I would like to pick up basically on the point that Paolo was making in terms of what is basically the organization or the institution of the domestic financial system, and to raise the question of the implications for the international financial system, because I don't think it's possible for us to continue to discuss how we're going to adapt or to reform our national financial systems to the existence of digital currencies and these new accounting methods in terms of uh, distributed ledgers without taking into account the implication that this has for the international system. Now, once I raise that question, uh, it instantly occurs to me that if we look at the current system, we know that in the Bretton Woods discussions, there were two alternatives that were discussed, and one was chosen, and one was rejected. Now, the one that was rejected was Keynes' proposal for the International Clearing Union, and the point which I'm going to try to make this morning, or this afternoon, wherever you happen to be, is that the changes in technology 
providing for the possibility of digital currency and these new accounting methods are probably more adapted to Keynes' proposal for an international clearing union than they are for the existing system, which I will argue is really a reserve-based uh, financial system. So to put this a little bit into background, if you think of the uh, message that Paolo has just given to us in terms of the U.S. historical experience, most of you will probably remember that we had a uh, relatively long period of what was called free banking or wildcat banking. And if you like, you can consider the existence of these multiple digital currencies that are running around as the equivalent of our modern experience of wildcat banking or free banking. Effectively, the response to that free banking was the creation of a prudential regulatory system in which the U.S. eventually created the central bank. Central banks were not an integral part of that response. The New York State had a safety system, but it was all a system of reserving against the issue of these wildcat currencies in order to produce stability in their value. And the eventual result, well, the eventual result was that the Federal Reserve was created on the basis of what we called a, uh, a reserve agency. In fact, the first proposals for the Fed were for a reserve agency rather than a central bank. And the use of those reserves by means of the accumulation of information about member banks. We now have things which are called call reports and we have reporting from the, the member banks, which requires information about the issue of the bank's liability. And basically, I think the point that Paula was trying to make is that if we are going to continue to have this kind of system, we have to have the information about the issue that we have to have call reports, we have to have transparency in terms of the creation of these new wildcat currencies. And if the central bank is going to continue to carry out monetary policy. And in fact, we know in the US case, uh, we gave up on the conditions of free banking and eventually after the uh, New Deal le legislation, the Federal Reserve pushed very strongly for all regulated banks to be members of the Federal Reserve sy system as well as part of the Federal Deposit Insurance System. So historically, what we found is that the evolution of the system does in fact go towards transparency. It goes towards the public creation of these uh, private sector currency creation. So this is just to give you a, a better sort of a framework in order to try to understand how we're approaching this system. Now, having said that, the question is how we can look at the difference between the Keynes and the existing Bretton Woods system and why I'm going to argue that the current technology is more adapted to uh, Keynes system. So the first question, what is the difference between a bank and a fund? And I'm pegging here on Keynes' comments at the creation of the, of the IMF in which he pointed out that he always thought, as he said, I always thought that the whole view that the christening had been badly done, that the names of the twins should have been reversed. That is, the bank should have been a fund and the fund should have been a bank. Well, why did we start out with a fund? Well, basically, we started out with a fund because the major contributors in the U.S. Treasury to the creation of the IMF, Harry Dexter White, started out his experience working for the U.S. Exchange Stabilization Fund which was created by Roosevelt's decision to go off gold in 34, and was patterned largely after the British Exchange Equalization Account of 32, which was also associated with the use of a fund in order to provide stability of exchange rates. And the bottom line with this new sort of approach, the fund approach, is that the system went from the gold standard in which each country was supposed to fix the uh, weight of gold in its unit of account to one in which we had what eventually were what I'm calling ERSAT buffer stocks. 
the funds were buffer stocks, which were set up in order to arrange price fixing. And that price fixing was fixing the price of uh, the price of the currency. Now, once we've recognized this, it's pretty clear where we see the response of, for example, Milton Friedman to fix the exchange rate, saying that if you're going to have markets, markets are going to have to determine exchange rates, but you can't fix rates in the presence of markets. And this was the attack on the system uh, towards flexible rates. So if we turn this around and we say, well, now we know what the fund was or what the, the pattern behind the idea of the fund was, what is the bank? Well, we all recognize that banks create purchasing power. They create means of payment. In the 1920s and the 1930s, it was already generally accepted that, I use Hartley Withers terminology here, that banks manufacture money, okay? Today, it's become very fashionable for central banks to rediscover the fact that loans create deposits. Well, any German or Austrian or British economist at the end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century knew this. Uh, we had Phillips' treatise on fractional reserve banking. Now, banks hold reserves to ensure that their deposits and the government notes have stable exchange rates. That is, you need to have a one-to-one exchange ratio between the private sector deposits and the notes that the government issue. So basically, this idea of using a bank was that you were going to have some sort of support, and I'm going to argue that that was the reserves that were held by the bank, that supported this one-to-one -one exchange ratio between government money and uh, private money. So if we look at the government forex to foreign exchange holdings and IMF quotas under the, what became the IMF system, these were in fact the reserves which were used to stabilize exchange rates. If you ask the question, what is the equivalent in the IMF of the reserves that private banks hold in a domestic system, you say there they are, they're the IMF quotas. Now, the difficulty here was that there was no credit creation. There were only swaps of national currency quotas into foreign exchange at the stable parity rate under the IMF. And this is what created, if you like, confusion between the bank and the fund. The fund couldn't create money, banks could, but the fund didn't have the ability to create credit and therefore they couldn't act as, or basically the IMF could not act as lender of last resort. So what you had was the operation of a fund pattern after a bank that is reserved supporting the uh, national currency, but no bank credit creation power. And in this particular case, if you wanna look at the way the system has evolved, it has evolved or it has changed. Why? Because of the supposed lack of its ability to do what? To create sufficient global liquidity. Well, if it didn't have the ability to create money, it certainly couldn't do that. And if you look at FDRs, SDRs are in fact only a workaround of this outdated system of fixed quotas. That is to try and increase the amount of money in the fund, but it doesn't solve the problem that the system indeed can't create liquidity as a bank. Yes. Now, Keynes' alternative was also based on an analogy, but with the domestic banking system, but with a different banking system. This was a kind of banking system based on what he called the banking principle. David Ricardo had already recognized the operation of this banking system when he said, in fact, we really don't need money at all if banks are able simply to write off one account against another to debit and credit accounts so that payments can be made without the need of any specie or paper notes, allowing it what we call the his more econ economical mode of effecting our payments. So the question was, was it possible to make these payments without having some underlying physical money. And if you didn't need the underlying physical money, well, then you really didn't need the reserve anymore. This was really an alternative approach to the banking system. Hence called this bank a bank money system. And he says it depends on nothing except that the transference of debts themselves is just as serviceable for the settlement of transactions as in the transference of money in terms of which they are expressed. So basically, if we look at Keynes' proposal, Keynes' proposal was to take his idea of the banks asking as simple bookkeepers, debiting and crediting, 
for individual clients in a domestic system under the international level. So he said, my proposal is what? Based on the necessary quality of credits and debits, of assets and liabilities. If no credits can be removed outside the clearing system, but only transferred within it, it can with safety make what advances it wishes to any of its members with the assurance that the proceeds can only be transferred to the clearing account of another member. Its problem is solely to see to it that its members keep the rules and that the advances made to each of them are prudent and advisable. And so this is what we used to call due diligence in banking and the credit officer in the bank, which apparently has now been replaced by, uh, well, has, was replaced by a computer, and now it's going to be a replaced by some sort of digital contract agent. So in this sort of system, you don't need physical money. If you don't have physical money, you don't need prudential reserves. And Keynes made the relatively uh, outlandish statement that in this side of system, you really don't even need bank capital. All you need is a common notional unit of account in which to keep the books. So if countries hold their accounts on a global balance sheet, then Keynes argues the analogy with a national banking system is complete. No depositor in a local bank suffers because the balances, which he leaves idle, are employed to finance the business of someone else. Thus, as the development of national banking systems served to offset the deflationary pressure, which would have prevented otherwise the development of modern industry, so by extending the same principle into the international field, we may hope to offset the contractionist pressure present under the gold standard. And this was Keynes' alternative banking system, that is, this banking principle system, no money, no reserves, that he produced as his alternative. Now, this sort of system, as we know, does not even require a global currency. Keynes suggested Bancor, but Bancor really is not necessary. And this was made very clear by an alternative plan that Schumacher put forward, which is very similar to Keynes' plan. But Schumacher argued that you really didn't even need this representative global currency, which caused so much difficulty. Uh, amongst experts in the United States, they called Bancor a funny money because basically it, not, it did not exist. Schumacher went one step further and argued as long as you had a provision for liquidity within the system, exchange of currencies back and forth in terms of debits and credits, you didn't even need to have the representation of the unit of account, although you still needed it. So the question is now, why consider the clearing union now? Well, we have the advanced technology for the banking principle in the form of blockchain distributed ledgers. We can run this global balance sheet and we can set up an institution which simply provides the debiting and crediting of the system. Most central banks are now contemplating a notional digital unit of account, central bank digital currency, and the question is how we're we going to integrate those central bank digital currencies into this global balance sheet. Okay. Some are even considering the issue of, of CBDC's deposit accounts to the public, which would basically eliminate the fractional reserve creation of pri private means of payment. And this would mean effectively approaching very close to the idea of 100% banking. You ask the question, what would happen to spread banking and bank earnings? Well, Clearly, this is a question that still remains to be investigated. All of these changes would facilitate a clearing arrangement. Indeed, there is a private one that already exists. I've been impressed by the fact that there is a private sector, existing private sector system that provides all of these particular aspects that could be adapted very quickly at the, uh, at the international level. So the conclusion, is that the decision on public versus private digital architecture is thus also linked to the reform of the international financial system architecture. If we don't have an open public digital architecture, then we are not going to have the possibility of an international financial system that can provide any sort of shape of international or, uh, or global stability. So this is, as I say, my, my pitch for reconsidering or the idea of reconsidering digital currencies for national financial systems 
requires us to reconsider the international financial system and my proposals to let us have a serious look at change clearing union as one possible complement to digital currencies at the national level. Thank you. Thank you, and let me pass it on to Charles. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't, alas, have a lovely young lady to read out my words, uh, but I hope I've got a lovely lady with you who's going to put up my, um, my PowerPoint slides, because I'm hopeless at anything to do with electronics, including anything to do with CVDC, about which I'm really rather a skeptic. I may get back to that if I have time at the end. Uh, Elizabeth, can you share screen and put my slides on? Lovely, thank you very much. If you can turn to the next one, please. Right, um, I'm going to talk about the lessons that we, of the past few years, that may possibly aid us in the future in order to improve uh, monetary policy and financial regulation. Uh, now, of course, it's always easier uh, to look backwards because we've got the inestimable benefit of hindsight. Um, and these are some of the lessons that I would draw. Uh, the first one is that, unfortunately, financial regulation is inherently pro-cyclical. Uh, what happens is you get a crisis, crisis particularly if it is involved with some kind of financial difficulty, uh, immediately leads everyone to cry, this must not be allowed to happen again, we must put in some kind of new regulation to stop whatever it was that was going wrong. Um, and that will happen again and again and again, this happened continuously, of course, in the past. And one of the problems here is that the introduction of regulation in the short run as the regulated, particularly the banks, try to adjust to the new regulation uh, leads to um, a reduction in banking activity, in credit expansion, uh, monetary growth and so on. Uh, one, uh, there's a, a, effectively a very good paper recently out by Mendocino and others that uh, shows that although uh, improved bank regulation, and bank regulation has been much improved, uh, is strongly beneficial in the longer term, that in the short run, something like 40, 25 to 40 percent of the long run benefits are offset by short run costs. One of the reasons why uh, expansionary policies after the great financial crisis had relatively little effect uh, in Europe and indeed um, in the UK and to extent in the US was that the massive expansion in uh, the monetary base uh, the reduction in interest rates, the quantitative easing and all of that uh, was offset to some large extent by the fact that the banks were drawing in their horns and were, were required to draw in their horns so that the expansionary policies that were undertaken by the central banks did not uh, work through into broad monetary growth. Uh, I might add immediately for that um, to say that that has not been true in the case of COVID, uh, because COVID had nothing to do with weaknesses in the financial system, and indeed the stronger financial regulations uh, helped the financial system uh, to weather any problems uh, during the COVID crisis, so that the monetary expansion has worked through directly uh, into the broader monetary aggregates. Uh, we will indeed see very clearly in the next few years whether or not uh, the Milton Friedman approach uh, to inflation, that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon and is caused by too much money chasing too few goods, uh, is completely dis disproved uh, or uh, gains, gathers some uh, revival. 
of course, when the economy settles down and when uh, life returns to normal and there are no uh, financial crises over the last few years, uh, the existence of these regulations, which almost by definition must prevent banks and bankers and those regulated from doing things that they want to do and from making profits that they would otherwise like to make, means that there is a continuing opposition uh, to such regulations and the banks learn how to avoid them and through lobbying and other fact me me methods uh, tend to weaken uh, the regular thrust of the regulation during normal periods. So during the good periods, which is when regulation ought actually to be tightened contracyclically, as a normal factor, they are actually loosened. Uh, so financial regulation is inherently pro-cyclical. And one of the problems for regulators and indeed supervisors is to try somehow or other to offset this inherent uh, development. Second comment that I would make is that monetary policy measures have much stronger effects on financial markets and asset prices than on expenditures on goods and services. The very uh, considerable expansionary policies that we've had in the past with very sharp declines in nominal and real interest rates, the massive increases in liquidity that we have seen uh, have undoubtedly been strongly responsible uh, for very considerable increases uh, in asset prices uh, really pretty much throughout the board, uh, including, I might add, uh, the price of Bitcoin, which is about as close uh, to the Dutch tulip mania as I think is as anything that I've seen in the modern world. But it's had much less effect on expenditures and goods and services. Could we go on to the next slide, please? Elizabeth, could you? There we are. And in particular, non-financial corporate fixed investment has been particularly disappointing uh, in view of the financial context. Uh, one of the areas where there has been some effect uh, of monetary policies uh, on our economy has been in the housing sector. Uh, but even there, there are a number of problems. One of these is the important question of how you should measure housing when you're looking at inflation and the definition of the CPI or, or RPI, whatever measure of inflation you might like to look at. Uh, COVID has caused a quite remarkable uh, differentiation between housing prices and rental values. The reason for that is, of course, that the effect of COVID has reduced lots of people's incomes and made them incapable of uh, meeting uh, their rental requirements. And as a result, uh, rents frequently have actually been um, uh, reduced in effect uh, during the course of the pandemic. While at the same time, the very expansionary monetary policies have been in influential in leading an increase in housing prices. The effect of that, particularly on the US CPI, is remarkable. If instead of having rents as the main, or rental values, as the main element in the CPI, you use housing prices, the CPI would be somewhere over a half a percent uh, higher than it currently is. In other words, it would already have have gone well, significantly over 3%, uh, no, not about 3%, rather than just over, I think, 2% as it is at the moment. Now, one of the reasons why um, non-financial corporate fixed investment uh, has been so disappointing has been the incentive structure of corporates, notably including banks. Um, and <clears throat> this is due to a combination of the incentive structure caused by limited liability, the bonus system of paying, corp paying uh, senior managers largely in the form uh, of, of equity bonuses, equity options, um, and limited liability. 
essentially and also the short time period that most CEOs will be in office. <clears throat> the consequence of that uh, is that the key or the incentive to the CEO is to bring about an increase in the short term equity value uh, of their particular company. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is to raise the return on equity by buybacks and high dividend payments rather than increasing uh, longer term uh, fixed investment or undertaking R&D. Indeed, limited liability is by far the most severe example of moral hazard um, that we have uh, because uh, with limited liability, if things go wrong, you pass the costs on to others, uh, fixed interest creditors, suppliers, employees, and if things go really bad, and <clears throat> there has to be a bailout even onto the taxpayer. While at the same time, if things go well, uh, you get a very considerable, considerable benefit. Uh, and this is effectively the definition of moral hazard. And it means that um, the CEOs, uh, including bank CEOs um, and others involved in, uh, in running corporates, uh, are inevitably led uh, to uh, projects where there's a fairly considerable risk in the sense there's a high probability of, su of a strong success, but it equally a high probability of total failure. Um, and that uh, raises the question, uh, really, uh, of what to do about that, which I'll come to in a moment. The final comment that I'd make about the past is that given the pervasive disinflationary trends, uh, which in our book on the great demographic reversal, uh, we regard as arising from very, very beneficial de demographics over the recent 30 to 40 years, combined with globalization and the shift of manufacturing production from high wage economies in North America and Europe to low wage economies in uh, Northern Asia, particularly China, and also Eastern Europe, uh, the old area uh, that was in the, the um, behind the Iron Curtain. Given these pervasive disinflationary trends, it would have been a lot better if the inflation target had been set at a lower level, uh, maybe naught or one percent, uh, rather than striving uh, to raise or to increase the, um, the expansionary nature of monetary policy, raise asset prices, uh, increase the incentive to raise leverage and to go into debt uh, that we have uh, had at the moment. So on to the uh, next slide, please. That leads on to three um, current problems. The first one is that dealing with moral hazard particularly limited liability causing excessive leverage through regulation has a, a number of inherent drawbacks. It, it runs counter to the unchanged incentives uh, of those managing the, the corporates. It also runs counter in many ways to the incentives for regulators and accountants. Um, regulators ought, uh, if the system is going to work well, to close down uh, banks and businesses running into trouble uh, significantly before they become totally insolvent. But the incentive for regulators is actually to allow them to carry on as long as possible until they are clearly insolvent, because otherwise you would run into um, a significant legal challenge, which would make your life very difficult. Uh, so the incentive for regulator is not to do anything with banks and companies getting into difficulties until insolvency is patent. Equally, of course, accountants are paid for and work by the companies for whom they are doing the audits, and that in that way has its own incentive problems. And again, the regulation leads business to shift into unregulated areas, 
So the more that you're going to regulate banks, the more that you are going to find that uh, financial intermediation will shift off into unregulated or much less regulated areas, sometimes offshore as well. So move on into the next uh, slide, please. Uh, the next effect of the monetary policies that we've had, particularly since the GFC and beyond that, has to bring about debt ratios that are so high uh, and the duration of the debt being so short, uh, for which QE is to blame in the public sector, that really now raising nominal interest rates other than glacially slowly would have very severe adverse effects on debt service ratios and hence on fiscal costs, corporate solvency and financial and asset markets. We've really got ourselves stuck into a debt trap. Now, it may of course be, and the mainstream believes it to be the case, that inflation and interest rates, after maybe a short transitory blip as we come out of COVID, uh, will remain low for as long ahead as you can see. For reasons, again, that are set out in our book, we think that it is at least complacent to think that there isn't a significant uh, concern developing now about rising inflation, perhaps particularly in the United States, uh, given what has happened to your fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, broad monetary growth now rising at somewhere around 25% per annum uh, has really never been seen uh, for any extended period of time uh, other than in wartime when inflation was held down, at any rate in my country, by a system of rationing. Uh, and indeed, the policy measures, especially in the US, are quite likely to unanchor inflation expectations quite quickly and may not reverse all that quickly either because the policies are going to be and have been pro-cyclical uh, and will continue and indeed intended by the Fed to continue about it for about as far a, a, a ahead uh, as one can think. Um, uh, the Fed, to put it mildly, have firmly adopted uh, the tenets and proposals of modern monetary theory, while all at the, t the same time, most central bankers are denying that they have anything to do with modern monetary theory, but they are simply uh, applying modern monetary theory in practice. Uh, whether for good or ill, we shall find out fairly soon. So, what should we do? And please on to the next uh, 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 slide, please. Well, um, I think that we should change incentive structures, that that is much more fundamental, much more desirable um, than regulation to try and prevent uh, inappropriate activities. Uh, I think, and I, we've, I've argued in a number of papers, that we should remove limited liability for corporate insiders, perhaps re even requiring that the CEO of any corporate, including banks, should have unlimited liabilities. Perhaps we should make an instigate a, a form of penalty for regulators and accountants for failures on their watch. Maybe we should require mandatory inspection for any firm whose probability of default rises above some level on one or more of the standard uh, models estimating PD. Now, one of the questions that I think that this raises, one of the questions that we ought to be asking ourselves and are not, is how much risk taking does society actually want or need? Uh, should we make the incentives such the people take very little risk? How much risk should a really well-functioning and developing and growing society, how much risk do we want our, the leaders of our, of our businesses, for example, to take? Next, second, the reversal of favorable demographics and globalization trends will inevitably slow aggregate growth because aggregate growth is simply a function of the growth of the number of workers 
together interacting with the extra productivity that they can achieve. And if the number of workers, the growth of the number of workers is slowing down, and in many countries such as China and Germany is now actually strictly falling, that is going to put much more pressure on our system in many ways. Um, uh, inevitably, taxes will decline for a given tax rate and will put much more pressure on fiscal policy. COVID was simply a blip along the way. The real fiscal problems are caused by the aging structure of our society, not by COVID at all. So on to the next. So how ought we to respond? I think inevitably, given the uh, deficits, given the debts, given the problems of an aging society, given, given the slower rate of growth, we are going to have to have higher taxes, higher tax rates. Which taxes? Uh, all taxes are unpopular um, and many can be avoided or evaded. And there's a limit to the extent that you can tax the rich and hope that you can get away with that. Should we have later retirement, less state support for the aged? I've actually just been listening to a seminar on longevity. And one of the arguments there is that there may be ways, medical ways, to increase the expectation of life. Uh, that would increase, if you keep the age of retirement the same, the period for which we uh, are pensions, we're going to need still care, Medicare, and the expense of aging, which is quite considerable. Perhaps we should have a higher inflation target. I think that G will be greater than R, the growth rate will be higher uh, than the rate of interest, because the rise in inflation that I see coming will exceed the rise in nominal interest rates because we can't raise nominal interest rates that fast or that far for the reasons that I was say, say, saying. And there are limits, political limits, to the rise in, in taxation that can be introduced. But that leads on inevitably to one of the key questions. If you have a higher inflation target, can you hold inflation to target at 4%? Because uh, one of the advantages of a 2% inflation target was that it was so low that people didn't really feel inflation at any time. But if you have 4%, they do feel inflation and their, their own wage and price adjustments will respond. So that I think is a query. Um, and uh, to put it bluntly, uh, I think we're increasingly in trouble uh, we, the societies of the West, uh, with the declining share of the population in the working age population, uh, with an aging society, uh, with, with ourselves being caught in a debt trap, uh, how are we going to get out of it? It's not going to be easy. Uh, I think I ought to leave it at that, though I would say that if I had time, I would put forward a very skeptical view about the importance and the extent to which CBDC, central bank digital currency, will actually change the life of central banks or become a major element in our monetary system in future decades. Charles, uh, thank you very much. Um, before I go to the questions in the queue, let me ask if any of the panelists have questions for one another. Well, let me start since I ended with CBDC. There's a very good paper that I recommend both to Jan, but particularly to Paola, uh, by Peter Bofinger and uh, an economist called Haas uh, in the Sewer Working Paper series which asks what are the selling points of actually holding CBDC um, for a corporate uh, or at the limit an individual. Uh, a bank deposit gives you a lot of advantages which the CBDC would not, including access to overdraft. Uh, if something goes wrong, you can sue the bank you can't sue the central bank or the government very easily. Uh, it provides you with much more privacy 
than having a CBDC would do. And how many of us really want all our transactions to be known by the government? Um, there are perhaps three reasons, and I think only three, that I can think of why anyone uh, would want to hold a CBDC deposit at the central bank rather than a deposit at the central bank. The first one, which I think Jan in a sense touched on, uh, is that the present costs and mechanisms of international payment transfers are very inefficient and the CBDC might indeed speed and help that up. The second one, is that you would certainly want to run into CBDC if you think that your banks or banks banking system is likely to go insolvent and to default. But that, of course, raises the additional problem of runs, which means that a CBDC, rather than making the system more stable, is likely to make it less stable uh, unless you run into have certain rather fancy uh, mechanisms of trying to evade that, avoid that. And the third one is if you think your own currency uh, is going to nosedive, then you would rather have a holding of a stable coin. Incidentally, Bitcoin has nothing to, whatsoever ever to do with money, I'm, uh, except, of course, if you have to pay a kidnapper or a black, blackmailer. But otherwise, Bitcoin is so volatile, no one in their right mind would think of it as money. Um, it's the, the stable coins like Libra. Uh, and indeed, the, the problem for central banks, uh, particularly in emerging countries, is that if people were worried about the value of their own domestic currency, they might want to move into Libra uh, or some kind of stable coin. But that makes the international monetary system in many ways less stable. So that I would argue that under normal circumstances, a an ordinary bank deposit is much better than a CDB CBDC holding. And it only comes into its own when it is actually likely to destabilize either the domestic or the international monetary system. Jan, would you like to uh, start and reply? Okay. No, I don't think we have a great deal of disagreement with Charles' skeptical view about the utility and the efficiency of these proposals. On the other hand, probably a more realistic view about the probability that these things will eventually be introduced and cause extreme difficulties because they are not stopped. I mean, one of, I think one of the, the difficulties here uh, is taking... Uh, Charles's first point is that financial regulation is always backward looking. And unfortunately, had we been more forward looking with things like credit default swaps and other types of instruments and implemented regulations looking forward, we might have avoided some of the massive increases in liquidity that were generated by financial innovations, which are very similar to the kinds of digital practices that we're currently looking at. So I think it's, it's more a, a, an admonition to the regulators to say that it would be best not to be quite so cavalier in uh, permitting the extension of these sorts of instruments until we have a very clear idea of their implications and what sort of regulations would be uh, would be appropriate in order to uh, in order to keep them to keep them under control. I mean, as we know, and this is again going back to another aspect of Carl's uh, idea of limited liability, that as long as we keep the incentive structure the way it is, and I can now bring in Minsky's idea in terms of uh central banks validating new innovative structures that those things together will in fact encourage the continued introduction of new financial practices which will increase liquidity in the system without adequate control and as i say i think this is part of the part of the difficulty as you know minsky was always very much in favor of lender of last resort because it prevented financial breakdown but he was also very much against the validation of new financial practices because he says as soon as you bail out, for example, a credit default swap without eliminating it, 
then you make it part of common practice and you've implicitly changed the behavior of the system. So basically, I think what I'm trying to argue is that there are going to be changes in the system that result from uh, distributed ledger. There are going to be changes in the system that result from digital currencies. And these changes in national systems will also have an impact on international systems. And it might be sensible to start thinking about this now uh, rather than waiting until we have a crisis which causes this to regulate looking backwards rather than looking forward. Paolo, Paolo would you like to respond? Charles, you have raised too many questions, too much question marks. We have to simplify what is the problem that we have to face. My position is that the main risks comes from the instability of money and the financial market. Suppose that uh, because of inflation is exactly what Charles said, and the inflation goes up 2%, <clears throat> what should we do with the rate, the interest rate? I think we have to rise the interest rate in order not to give incentives to bad investments, real investments. This is an elementary point. But let me go back to the problem that I raised. If you, in one year, the <clears throat> cryptocurrencies, only the cryptocurrencies, non all the other shape of cryptos, uh, increased of about 2,000 billions of dollars equivalent, which means that the private sector has created something of a similar of the multiplier of a monetary base. And they are in condition to intervene in the real sector through crypto credits given to deposit of cryptocurrencies, giving not a public money, but their own money. Uh, the most popular is the USDT, which is very intelligent. They use the, the uh, uh, USD, the uh, official definition of the uh, um, American dollar, and then Tether, the change, we are losing the information how to work the market. We have to regain the information to take decision in money and financial uh, market, on money and financial market. It's not a problem of a fiscal policy. The market will take care of the recovery of a post-pandemia. This is my position, which is doing now already the best part of the recovery. The problem is we have no a reply how to protect the banking system from developments of a platforms which are performing the uh, banking business without the regulation. So if you are prepared an anarchic market Okay, you are right. But obviously, my actual profession pushed me to find a solution which is not yet on the table of the authorities. And Jan put a very important problem. The private sector has already invented, outside the public authorities, a sort of a clearing house. What Keynes had the mind when he was proposing a global money. They have already invented and, and the platform are performing the business to uh, change uh, uh, Bitcoin with other cryptocurrency and to create an outside system. So if we accept this solution, I think that, uh, let me insist, the risks will come according to the Minsky opinion and some other opinions. Uh, uh, sooner or later, the crisis like the derivatives market will come again from the financial sector. This is my opinion. Thank you.
Charles, would you like to respond? Well, I, I agree almost entirely with, with Jan. Um, I don't see um, uh, Bitcoin and the, uh, the uh, cryptocurrencies as being a significant threat. Uh, and the regulators are always behind uh, the time. They're always trying to catch up. Uh, for example, the uh, problems that uh, the uh, treasury market, the treasuries in the US had in September last year and in March this year, uh, it's still not very clear quite why that happened. Uh, the role of high frequency traders, HFT, uh, in markets is again not, I think, fully understood or fully known. Uh, I, I, my worry about Bitcoin is actually what happens when the bubble bursts. An awful lot of people are going to lose an awful lot of money and going to um, uh, feel very, very unhappy uh, about that um, and, and as a result. Um, so, um, and I, I, again, that's, I think, one of the reasons why I think that changing the incentive structure would be better than changing regulation because the regulators are always behindhand. They're always struggling to catch up with the, um, fin the uh, private sector financial operators who have much more resources, pay much more money to get the best people, uh, pay good lawyers to find the way around the regulations and so on. Um, uh, and, and yes, there will always going to be financial crises and yes, we never quite know what's going on because the world is always changing in a way we can only dimly perceive, particularly among the regulators. Uh, Charles, Charles, we, did, we did make a conscious decision to allow most of our financial institutions in the US to become limited liability companies. Would you be in favor of going back to some sort of partnership or other Corporate yeah, but the, the problem is that you've got to have limited liability for uh, ordinary investors uh, because the scale of business is so great that you've got to have, you, you really got to have some kind of limited liability. I want to have sort of two, two categories of investors, insiders who don't, who are not fully protected by limited liability and insiders who have, um, uh, who, who, sorry, insiders who are not fully protected by limited liability and outsiders who don't have control over, don't have power over the decisions that are, be, that are being made by the corporation. So to some extent, yes, I know I, I would like a, a change in the, in, the, in the corporate structure that we have. Charles, maybe this is a good time to take a question from the queue, which uh, relates to this. Someone asks, uh, concerning your use of the term limited liability, while that term has a specific legal meaning in the United States, I don't understand its use with regard to bank investment decisions. Can you clarify? Um, if you have limited liability, uh, the value of your shares can only go down to zero. Um, and you don't lose what you put in, you don't lose anything more. So that if there is a big loss involved, that loss has to be borne by others. And uh, that happened, it happened obviously with Lehman's, um, and that causes all kinds of, of, of problems. But it does mean that, uh, that uh, uh, people are prepared to take more risk than they otherwise would. I think that, and I admit that there is a counter example, which is that many CEOs, including I think Dick Fold, that's the right pronunciation, uh, of Lehman Brothers, are so confident that they don't actually see the risks involved in their actions. They think that their actions are much, much safer than they actually turn out to be. Uh, but if you had a, a example or two uh, of CEOs actually being forced into bankruptcy rather than leaving with millions and millions of, 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 of dollars in, uh, that they uh, post up during the time in office, 
I think it would have a salutary effect uh, on uh, all senior managers everywhere. Thank I wonder you. what Minsky would have thought of that. Um, I, 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 and as you say, I, I, he was very concerned about the tendency for um, finance to get out of hand, particularly in those circumstances when everyone thought everything was going well. What was it? Stability breeds instability. Jana Paolo, would you like to respond? Well, I don't know. I can simply say, Charles, that, that I was you know, very favorable in the fact that Michael Milken and even Boski managed to go to prison as a result of, well, to be convicted and eventually go to prison as a result of this. Now, we'd, at one, at one, there was a time in which not only uh, financial uh, management was taken under judicial review, but also we had uh, corporate management. And of course, this is something which has completely, completely disappeared, and most people don't remember that uh, that at one time it was possible to take management to court for price fixing. And in fact, some of them did work convicted and went to jail. And we will soon see whether Elizabeth Holmes goes to uh, jail. Uh, I want to switch subjects here. Someone asks, it's, uh, is it not odd that on a session on international financial regulation, there's no mention of climate breakdown and the need to urgently redirect the financial system towards supporting the rapid transition to carbon neutrality. Uh, I'll also mention in that context that uh, I, in my research for this panel, I found that Bitcoin mining generates between 22 and 23 megatons of carbon emissions uh, annually, which is roughly on the par with uh, <clears throat> the countries of Jordan or Sri Lanka. So what, uh, more, what generally should be the role of monetary policy with regard to carbon related issues and climate issues? And spe specifically, how does uh, the, uh, the cryptocurrency mining issue play into that? Charles, do you want to do that? Charles, you're on mute. Okay. Um, and it's, it's one of the many disadvantages of Bitcoin, which is that uh, in order to um, uh, do the technical work, um, there's an enormous usage of energy. Uh, most of the miners of Bitcoin are, I believe, actually situated in China, using a huge amount of energy, much of which still comes from um, coal uh, electricity generating stations. Uh, so that's a, another reason why Bitcoin is actually environmentally unsound. But really, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is not the issue. Um, I, I, my worry about Bitcoin is it's simply a, um, a bubble um, and it will lead to great upset and disturbance when the bubble bursts. The, the, the issue is not Bitcoin, it's Libra or now DM as it's now known. Uh, because Libra or DM was a stable coin, although it could have been uh, a developed or uh, set out in a way which was better than initially was set out. Uh, but because it was being provided, uh, I think it was by Facebook, it already had the basis of a huge um, uh, number of people who, who could and would use it. So it didn't have the problem of, uh, of getting a network and Libra actually made bank, central banks worry seriously uh, about whether they could command uh, control over their own monetary system against the alternative potential advantages of a Libra DM uh, type stable coin. And forget Bitcoin. I know, I know Bitcoin is sexy and it's fancy and it swings around and Everybody likes looking at it 
and it's it's it, 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 it's 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 journalistic stuff. Uh, but the real issue that caused the central banks uh, to worry and think deeply about CBDC was actually Lib Libra DM. Uh, they could ignore Bitcoin perfectly happily. Jan, would you like to respond to Paola? Yes, may I? Paola, please. The problem not are the Bitcoins, but the uses of Bitcoins. Bitcoins has been created in a fixed amount. So you have a fixed supply apart an, an amount a very modest amount. Also, little change in demand eh, causes the jump of the price. Then, when the Bitcoins start from $10,000 to $60,000, they are used first to give, uh, to give crypto credits. Second, they are used as collateral of derivatives. Sometimes the same Bitcoin is used for collateral of main of the same derivatives. They are in the blockchain system, which is outside the, the uh, authorities. The information are outside of the authorities. It is important that a stable coin should be regulated in order to get the information. Otherwise, also stable coin, how can, this is the problem that now we are facing also in Italy as in many other countries as in Europe. The problem is that stable coin means that you have for each cryptocurrency, you need an official asset, money or other kind of asset. But to get the information, if you stay in the blockchain Bitcoin style, you cannot do this business. This is why I use it. And China already made a, Bitcoin, a blockchain permissioned, is in condition to have a, a node, to have the so-called proof of authority, all the information are collected by the central bank or other authorities. I am uh, trying to get from my friend, Chinese friend, exactly information. There is the problem, I said, the problem are, are not the cryptocurrencies. The problem is the information they are in condition to protect. So it's something outside of the system. So you use the Bitcoins as collateral. You use the Bitcoin to create a, 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 a pseudo credit outside of the official. We are losing the information. You cannot do monetary policy, financial policy, and also fiscal policy. If the European Central Bank created a token of about 2 billion euro, plus the, with the three official banks, we can use. Uh, the, the, uh, for the moment of this term, you are in condition to collect the information because the three banks are in condition to supply to the authorities the information they need. The system is exploding. And I think the economists are losing the intellectual control over the developments as happened for the derivatives contracts. This is my position. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna, Jan? Okay, if I can just drop one thing in here. That one someone has recently suggested that most of these digital currencies eventually become the equivalent of Russian war bonds. Because they are dependent, well, they're dependent on governments and if the governments don't continue to support them, then obviously they disappear or they cease to have value. But even more importantly, if you talk to any archivist or any librarian, they will tell you that we have substantial operational risk in information storage. And the best example I can give you is the one that comes from uh, 
a science fiction book by Kaixin Liu, a Chinese uh, author, in a book called The Three Bo well, it's a triple book, The Three Body Problem, in which the world is invaded by aliens, the aliens take over the world, and in the end, the hero tries to preserve the history of the world. And he goes to the library in which the information is preserved, and he finds a man with a chisel against the stone wall. And he says, what are you doing? And he says, I am saving the history of the world because this is the only way that I can ensure that it will remain stable and it will exist over time. Because every other information storage system that we have has failed. How many of you have storage devices which your computer can no longer use or read? Eventually, Bitcoin or digital currencies run the same kind of risk as any sort of information. They depend on the institutional system that can recover them. And as we've seen with digital currencies, they are subject to substantial operational risk. Yeah, and there's an interesting question here in the queue uh, for you on a, a slightly different topic. Uh, someone writes, interesting proposals for a new international monetary system, but progress so far to enhance the role of the IMF as the liquidity provider has been slow. So de facto role, uh, the de facto role is, is provided by the Fed and its swap lines. And this has expanded dramatically lately, reflecting the huge increase in offshore dollar markets. And so the question is, can we realistically expect progress on international liquidity until we regulate the shadow banking system better? Well, I'm not sure that it's so much the shadow banking system that is the, is the difficulty here. The difficulty is in terms of the, how can we say, uh, the geopolitical distribution of interest in the system. The IMF, as it was set up originally, as I tried to suggest, was patterned on the, on the U.S. banking system and was of great support to the dominance of the U.S. banking system in global financial affairs. Currently, we have seen that, as Paulo has suggested, China has decided that they are no longer willing to go along with this sort of, uh, this sort of dominance and are attempting to challenge. Eventually, other developing countries, I think, will also uh, no longer be willing to accept the dominance that the U.S. system implies in terms of development financing. And one of the great advantages of the, clearing, uh, of the clearinghouse system is that it moves liquidity creation away from individual country provisions of liquidity into what is effectively global provision of liquidity and global distribution of risk over the allocation uh, of that liquidity. So that I think there are, uh, there are a number of factors going forward that suggest that there will be substantial changes in the way the system, the way the system uh, functions. And this is one of the reasons why I've been very critical of the idea of simply increasing SDR allocations. Because SDR allocations, number one, as I said, are simply a, a, a workaround of the problem of increasing quotas never manages to get done because of political problems. And secondly, the fact that the use of SDRs continue to require the combined agreement of the dominant countries, including the, including the United States. So it's a really very, very inefficient system if we're trying to solve things like international, uh, international income inequality or the distribution of international investment. And finally, for the, the people who are worried about the, uh, the fact that we haven't talked much about climate change, I would argue that this is really not appropriate for this particular session. But what is appropriate is in terms of the financing. And a clearing union system of financing would provide a much easier way of distributing financing to those developing countries who do not have the income levels in order to be able to respond to the changes which will be required. 
if we're going to have any sort of rational response to climate change and environmental degradation. Charles or Paola, would you like to comment on the shadow banking system and how it can be regulated or uh, also as well on the role of SDRs and, and their future? Oh, well, I think that Jan put everything extremely well. Um, I would go on to say that actually what has happened um, is that really the uh, main institution overseeing the health of the world's financial in and international monetary system has shifted from the IMF to the Fed. Um, and my greatest worry in recent years uh, has been that um, somebody uh, of the sort of persuasion of your pre prior president, Donald Trump, um, might have taken steps mistakenly to prevent the Fed uh, providing swap lines uh, with other central banks, which would have made, had, that, had a financial crisis uh, arisen, uh, the prevention of pro the provision of swap lines by the Fed uh, would have been absolutely totally disastrous. It would have, uh, would have driven us into, um, uh, in, into a degree of, of depression and chaos, uh, which we managed to avoid. Uh, what I would ask Jan, though, is that given that the system uh, has, as I think you said, uh, not only been to the benefit of the American banking system, but is now in practice actually run out of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, is it conceivably likely that any American president of any stamp whatsoever would actually take the kind of steps that you're suggesting to shift the focus of power uh, to the IMF away from where it now resides um, in the Federal Reserve Board and the American banking system uh, in the US. And in, in terms of pure, pure power, uh, is, doesn't the system still uh, work to the benefit of the United States and isn't that the reason why, to a large extent, why the IMF has never actually been allowed uh, to take up a role um, that even under its limitations as a, as a fund, it might have enjoyed under a more uh, equal uh, division of power? No, I think, Charles, you're, you're quite correct in the, in the short term. Uh, looking forward, we have seen that the Fed does not seem to be particularly efficient in regulating the U.S. domestic financial system. And were we to have another 2007, 2008, the, then we say, the possibility of the U.S. continuing to exert dominance on the international system, I think, would come under substantial pressure. And as conditions change, particularly in Europe and in China, in terms of the, what I see as a uh, reassembly of some sort of global agreement uh, across the, the tri, what we used to call the tripartite powers, that eventually the position of the U.S. will be, will come under a uh, redimensioning and eventually some sort of solution will have to be, will have to be sought. And this seems to be the most rational solution. Now, as we know, rationality is, as things always says, but you know, the market can remain irrational longer than you can stay liquid. And <laughs> the proposals that we have can remain valid probably not as long as the market can remain in, irrational and reject them. Well, we have about uh, two minutes remaining. Um, let me just turn to each of the panelists and, and if you would like to make perhaps a, a 30, 45 second closing remark, uh, I think that would be great. Paolo, let's start with you. Paolo, you're muted. Thank you. 
I am not sure that we have clear the ideas to the participants. We raised a lot of problems. I insist that if we do not solve the problem, market, free market means full information. What I said is that we are losing the information. So the market is reducing the possibility to a correct choice of the various investment, real and the financial. This is my conclusion. If we don't focus our attention on this point, I think that we will remain in the risk of the new severe crisis like in 2008. Thanks. Thank you. Charles? Uh, my worry is that all our societies are becoming much older. We live in a, in a world of, an, of, of aging population and the implications of that, uh, not only for our financial system, uh, but throughout, are actually going to be quite serious and haven't yet really been fully met or even properly thought about. Um, and that's a, uh, going to be a continuing and I fear worsening problem. Thank you. Jan? Okay, I'll just start out by uh, allowing Charles to make a plug for a very interesting book that he's written on this subject, which he has, he has very generously <laughs> not mentioned directly. So on this particular problem, I'd urge everybody to have a to have a look at the uh, the more extensive argument that Charles has made concerning this problem. The other is to respond is that I see one of the questions at the end says that the younger generation clearly accepts cryptocurrency. And just to to clarify the position here, it certainly is true that I I have students who have never written a check, who don't have bank accounts, and who are perfectly happy dealing in what we would call digital currencies. The question is not so much whether or not these things can be used or whether or not they will in fact replace checking accounts or banknotes or anything else. The question is whether they will be done in terms of an open architecture with public information or whether we will continue to allow these private payment systems to run. And the problem has existed since the beginning. Well, I first raised the issue, I think, about 10 or 12 years ago with PayPal, suggesting that this was a threat to the uh, policy possibilities of the Federal Reserve. And we've gone from PayPal to Google, Google Wallet to Apple Pay to you name it. And yes, everybody is perfectly happy with these things. The question is, how are they organized and is the information available? Are we going to have wildcat banks which create financial instability or are we going to regulate these wildcat banks and allow the system to impose some sort of prudential regulation? Well, thank you very much. And I'll just end very quickly by noting that we have a review of Charles's book in our publication, Advisor Perspective. So thank you very much. We've gone over by a couple of minutes, but I wanna move on and, and allow the next panel to start.